this talk is going to be about three projects and there are quite a lot of slides so I'll be going fast in places in case you'd like to go through this again later uh, I will upload the whole presentation to both the MinSouth and the Acton Mine websites the UnixMin project developed merciful robots for survey and exploration of flooded underground mines of which there are many thousands across Europe. Uh, the primary purpose is to assist in identifying unexploited raw material resources. UnixUp is a co-funded project to take the UnixMin technology to a fully commercial level and RoboMiners is an early stage research project to develop robotic mining concepts that go beyond just automation of existing mining equipment and mining technology and including bio-inspired robot designs as well as possible new mining strategies. Each of these projects involves consortium partners from many EU member states. Uh, AnnexMin and AnnexUp are coordinated by the University of Mishkolt in Hungary and the RoboMiners is coordinated by the Polytechnic University of Madrid in Spain. There's UK participation in all three of these projects. The 4D Coders team consists of a group of independent researchers, each of us running our own businesses. And the Acton Mine Educational Trust was a key participant in the UnixMin project and will probably also provide one of the demonstration sites for UnixUp. So first, the UnixMin project. This is the final robot design that was adopted with a pressure hull rated to a maximum depth of 500 meters and a range of instrumentation, including sonar and laser scanners, inertial navigation unit, uh, pH and temperature sensors, and a water sampler, multispectral camera, and five uh, ordinary color cameras for color and UV imaging. The system was deployed at five test sites of increasing complexity. Katiala mine in Finland was a pegmatite mine which produced high grade quartz and felspar from an open pit and had some short underground workings which are accessible to divers now. Uh, this is convenient in case the robot needed to be rescued. Idria is a very old mercury mine in Slovenia, uh, second only to Almaden. Uh, although a very complex mine layout, it's now mostly backfilled and all that was accessible for the robot dives was a section of shafts and one short level. This was used to test the basic navigation and autonomy functions. Osirisa mine in Portugal is a uranium mine with a deep shaft and a number of accessible levels. This allowed continuation of the navigation tests that were started at Idria. It will also provide the, the principal test site for robots in UnixUp, as it's close to the INESC Robotics Laboratory in Porto, which is responsible for the robot assembly in the project. Molnar Janus is a very extensive natural cave below the Budapest suburbs, and it's been well mapped by cave divers. So this was chosen as an ideal site to test the robot's navigation capabilities. And the fifth test site in Annex Min was Acton. Uh, this mine uh, was a copper mine in the southwest of the Carboniferous Limestone of the Peak District. Acton Mine is flooded to river level, but has about 300 metres depth of workings that have been flooded since the 1850s. Although there are some sketches and descriptions of the workings, the detailed 3D geometry of this mine is truly unknown. But we'll come back later to see some of the results of the Acton trials. Unexmin ended in October last year. Unex Up is a new project which is co-funded by EIT Raw Materials and goes on to the end of 2022. The purpose of Unex Up 
is to start from the Unix Min prototype and develop a robust series of robots to provide a commercial solution. This will then be offered as a service by a spin off company, Unix Min Geo Robotics, or UGR, which has already been set up. In the gap between the two projects, the Inesc Tech robot engineers in Portugal developed a proof of concept submersible to provide a more robust solution with similar dimensions to the UX1 robot, but modular and lighter in weight. The Unix Up project will lead to two final configurations. There's the UX1 Neo, which effectively replicates the UX1 basic capabilities from Unix Min, and eventually uh, in uh, 2022, the UX2 Deep, which will dive to 1500 to 2000 meters and uh, will have extra uh, capabilities including rock sampling. Of course, there are also a number of commercial ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, which are available, but none of them have the capabilities or the flexibility of the Unix Min and Unix Up robots. However, they do have a legitimate role in providing a commercial service. So this is the intended range of submersibles that UGR will be using in its services. The Blue Rov 2 is an inexpensive basic submersible, but includes a video camera and it generates data using the standard robot operating system. The principal uses that we see for this uh, are in training operators and programmers and also in preliminary visual inspection of sites. Uh, the Deep Trekker is a more serious ROV for use in site assessments to depths that are challenging for human divers and uh, it will help to avoid any risks to uh, either people or the expensive Annex Min Annex Up robots. The existing UX1 robots from the Unix Men project are of course still available for use, but they require a team of five or six people to operate them. And the new Unix Up robots are designed to be operated by a smaller team of two to three people, uh, so they provide for much more flexible solutions. And now for something about the Robominus project. This is a research project with broadly defined objectives. The primary interest is for exploitation of European sources of raw materials. Many of these, of course, are in abandoned and flooded underground mines or in small or deep deposits, perhaps below urban areas. We're looking at biological systems for inspiration, not only for the robot design, but also for the mining strategies. The types of mineral deposit environment that we're addressing includes abandoned mines, many of which will be flooded. Also small but high grade deposits, which may not be considered economic for conventional mining methods, but could then be exploited with a minimum of any mine infrastructure. And ultra deep mines, which may also be uneconomic for conventional mining, as well as physically dangerous due to high temperatures or the risk of rock bursts. The initial concept is to send robots down drill holes to self-assemble, to sense the ore and then to extract it in the form of a concentrate slurry that can be transported to the surface for further processing. Bio inspiration would come from burrowing animals if of different types and sizes, from insects and worms up to moles and rabbits. And feeding patterns are also a guide to possible innovative mining strategies. The anticipated size range of Robo Miners robots is between those of conventional large mining equipment and of most rather small mobile robots. Selective mining can be achieved dynamically 
by using a variety of different methods of sensing the ore grade and new algorithms for optimizing the production. Real-time mineral processing decisions will be made possible by using in-stream mineralogical and chemical analysis. Although we won't be creating every component module, the project will develop the concept of a robotic mining ecosystem adapted to the unique environment of each deposit. Thus one deposit might be mined using drill holes and blasting, another by cutting, but this would be achieved simply by attachment of different modules to a common robot miner body. Of course, boreholes or shafts are not the only access methods. Ramps, declines, adits or drifts are all possible. And for existing abandoned mines, the access method may already be defined, of course. Trust you're all wide awake now. For large diameter holes, as originally envisaged in the project specification, large equipment is needed, of course. This is not part of the robot system. There are many conventional mining methods. Uh, some are more appropriate to the robotic environment than others. We shall go through the following slides very quickly. There are simple conventional stoping methods that have been used since medieval times, if not longer, but these could also be appropriate. Various flavours of cut and fill mining are possible. The common factor is the integral use of backfill, which will be an important feature of Robomina's operations. This is a cut and fill variant as actually used in the Neves Corvo mine, Portugal. For flat-lying seam or reef deposits, room and pillar mines are very common, and if pillars are eventually to be extracted, backfill can be used to minimise collapse of the hanging wall. Long wall mining is also used for seams and reefs, typically for coal, but also for other minerals such as potash. Very often the mined area is left to collapse, but it can be backfilled to minimise the surface disturbance. Apart from conventional mining methods, bio-inspired layouts may also be feasible, but some are not possible. The difference is that a robot miner needs a communication line to the surface and also needs a method of transporting ore to the surface. An animal, on the other hand, is not tethered and has only to feed itself. There are actually a host of such geometric constraints Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss them all here. Some bio-inspired layouts could work well. For 2D seam deposits, for example, a sequence of star-shaped patterns of production drives allows iterative extension of slurry pipes and communication cables to a succession of central nodes. Many animal feeding trails consist of side-to-side -side zigzag random walks, which again can translate well to a mining strategy. Mining a three-dimensional deposit may be trickier. A helical extraction tube could be the basis for a mine layout. Alternatively, a random branching network could work, but both are likely very fast to become topologically too, com too complex. This is a CT scan of a real burrow network in what is believed to be a Triassic ant's nest. Although it appears complicated, it actually consists of a series of broad main tunnels with short excavation drives from nodes along them. A 3D analogue of the star pattern in the two-dimensional case. We also need to consider backfill if we're to minimise the amount of surface waste dumping and also provide some support to reduce risks of subsidence. In summary, we need a mining ecosystem that can achieve optimum extraction from small deposits using robots that have onboard sensors and intelligence to assist the operator 
to achieve the holy grail of selective mining. So now, as promised, something about the results from the unexmin trials at Ecton. Ecton is a polymetallic copper lead zinc mine located in the southwestern part of the Derbyshire Dome in the Carboniferous Limestone. The outermost few metres of the deep Ecton edit were in a dangerous state and needed some restoration work to allow safe access for the trials. Dry stone arching, which had stood for 200 years, was beginning to fail and some ominous bulges were also developing in the north wall of the adit. The solution adopted was to excavate a trench, restore the arching and then to recover it. A highly skilled master mason, Peter Rowe from Swaledale, was contracted to rebuild the arching working closely with archaeologist John Barnett in order to meet the exacting demands of historic England as Acton Mine is a scheduled monument. During the excavation, John Barnett kept a detailed archaeological record, and this is now published in uh, Mining History, the Peak District Mines Historical Society Journal. The whole restoration project was completed using traditional dry stone walling methods. And once the arch was completed, the Acton Mine Trust were permitted to protect it with reinforced concrete capping to avoid potential problems in the future. This was completed with a concrete pour in early November 2018. The opportunity was also taken to refurbish and galvanise the inner steel door and the outer gate to the adit. So with safe access guaranteed, the robot trials could begin. We've got a short video to show to introduce this. I'm John Barnett, I'm an archaeologist and welcome to the Ecton Mines. There are thousands of abandoned mines in Europe. Ecton in England is one of the most famous ones. As our life requires more and more raw materials, we have to search for new ways to find them. One of the options is to reassess old mines, but as most of them are flooded, to carry out safe and cost-effective surveys, serious technological innovations are needed. The Unexmin team has been set up to develop an autonomous robot solution called UX1. Only 60 centimetres in diameter, which will autonomously map the abandoned flooded mines and gather valuable geological and mineralogical information. Under the lush pastures of the Peak District National Park in central England, valuable minerals can be found. On top of the hill, they started mining in the Bronze Age about 4,000 years ago. By 1790, it was one of the biggest mines. It earned the Duke of Devonshire a fortune. They were 300 metres below river level, and all that had to be pumped whenever they were mining there. We know a lot about these upper workings, those that aren't flooding, and we understand them well. But beneath the water, no one's been there since the 1850s. The deep shafts and the historical mystery make Ecton a perfect test site for the Unexmin project. As UX1 has already proved in other test sites, it has no problem with cruising in murky waters. But to reach the dive sites, it needs considerable help from its creators. Ecton Mine Educational Trust has adapted a small stone building, originally built by a former owner, into a well-equipped study centre. For three weeks, the main teaching room is being occupied by engineers and scientists representing seven countries, and it's transformed into a state-of-the-art control room. They have various communication lines with the dive site down below, from people to people, from people to robot, 
and from robot to computer. The UX1 is armed with dozens of high-tech instruments for mapping, sampling and evaluating. And all of it needs to be prepared and tested before the dive can start. It seems like everything works according to plan. The only question is whether the plan works in practice. There are old schematic drawings of the deep shafts. But the only thing historians know for sure is that they depict just a fraction of the reality. This is the opportunity by diving in the water with the submersibles to find out for the first time what is there. No one knows what awaits an explorer in the shaft. Therefore, careful initial mapping is essential before the descent. Everything is going fine. The UX-1 can finally leave the surface. Now is the time for the underground team to ease up a bit. Pressure is now on the mission controller. The robot can operate underwater for up to five hours. The surface team in the control room is eagerly watching the transferred data of all types, as they want to get the most out of every second the UX-1 spends exploring the underwater mysteries of Acton. Each monitor is set up to display different kinds of information. The UX-1 builds up a real-time 3D model of its environment by analyzing and combining flow meter, sonar, laser beam and accelerometer information. The tension in the room is palpable when the depth exceeds 100 meters. Indeed, it would have been hazardous for a human, but the UX-1 can confidently carry on with the operation even under difficult and dangerous conditions. As a historic mine, this is one of the most important in Britain because it was one of the richest mines in Britain in the 18th century. It's protected by law as nationally important. There's 300 metres of flooded workings and they're very complicated and we've never known in any detail what's beneath the water and now we're starting to learn. UX-1 is a robot developed within a UNEXPIN project funded by the European Commission in the frame of a European Union Horizon 2020 framework programme for research and innovation. There were three launch sites, all about 400 metres from the ADIT portal it was the pumping shaft and the adjacent winding shaft, and then uh, to the southeast, the main pipe working. This shows the parts of the mine that were explored during the dives, superimposed on an 1858 elevation view of the mine. The pale green shows the uppermost 60 metres of the main pipe workings below edit level. The pipe is recorded to go to the, the full depth of the mine, uh, 300 metres below water level. The pale blue shows entrances to mine workings which may connect with the main pipe, but uh, these are not yet explored. Both of the shafts are themselves blocked at 112 and 125 metres. It's not known if these blockages are just local 
or if they represent fill that goes to the full depth of the mine. The geology of Ecton is complex, dominated by folding, but also with some faulting. And it represents the local response of the Western Peak District to the stresses of the Hacinian orogeny. This composite image shows typical fold styles at Ecton, fairly tight folds with uh, amplitude of uh, maybe two to five meters. As I mentioned, uh, there are a number of openings from the shafts into uh, pipe workings, uh, which may connect with the main uh, pipe that was exploited. Uh, on some of the images, it's possible to make out a, a distant wall, but the light isn't strong enough to estimate how far. Uh, on this particular one, um, we think that it's at least 15 to 20 meters. Uh, on others, it could well be much more. Below 60 meters depth, much of the limestone is thin bedded and shaly, and the fold style changes to extreme crumpling like this with much smaller amplitudes typically. In areas close to the pipe mineralization, there are zones of intense calcite veining with multiple generations of emplacement. There is also small scale bedding plane faulting as shown on the slicken sides on this uh, image. It's uh, synchronous with and a consequence of the intense folding. There are also hints of multiple fold phases, such as in this refolded anticline and in this tight syncline. Although much of the mine infrastructure, including anything of value, was removed during progressive retreat from the deeper levels during the 19th century. A lot of the timbering remains in place. The rubble slope behind these props may indicate backfill of the pipe workings, but further exploration is needed in order to find out. This is a scanning sonar model of the large open part of the upper pipe working with the, showing the robot uh, to scale. It's from 20 to 60 meters below the water level, an estimated height up to 40 meters and the width uh, 50 meters or more. At the bottom of this part of the pipe working, there's a short three meters cross cut to the winding shaft on the left, and the pipe working continues downwards on the right of this composite image. Above the large open part of the pipe working is a zone that we've called the Swiss cheese. It's a labyrinth of workings, mostly towards the end of the mine life in the mid 19th century, extracting every last trace of mineralization. Much of this was from the limbs and axial planes of folds, and it was described by some authors as saddle deposits. This is a plan view showing the position of the explored pipe working from the launch point at water level to the east of the two shafts. There is an enigmatic structure in the winding shaft immediately opposite the short cross cut from the pipe. The timbers here may have fallen from above, according to our archaeologists, but the metal hoop, possibly from a barrel, appears to have been deliberately placed. The reason for this is completely unknown. This well-built wall next to the pumping shaft appears to be a dam. It could be a cistern for temporary water storage if pumping used a two-lift system. Or more excitingly, it could be part of the recorded 34-fathom boat level. A canal was actually used to transport ore to another shaft at Apes Tor for lifting to the surface. The 10 dives succeeded in exploring only a small fraction of the mine. The red, blue and green dots on this section show the locations for possible future exploration 
uh, some of which may be possible during the Annex Up project. We have a little time left now, uh, so uh, I'd like to show a couple of minutes of video uh, taken actually by the robot during one of the dives. Of course, the, the captions and the music on this were added later. Uh, Ecton may be unique, but uh, its uniqueness doesn't extend to having an underwater orchestra. Thank you for staying the course. I'm quite happy to answer any questions that you might have, uh, or if you're gluttons for punishment, uh, we have some more videos if you'd like to see them. <laughs>